We are live on Facebook. I think. So I'll give people about 30 more seconds just to start logging in and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, we're good to go here. Thank you everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, this is week three of our webinar series. Uh, we have one last session here next week on April 20th. So we are at the halfway mark, but uh, we have plenty of good information left. Uh, in fact, some of the, I'd say some of the best is yet to come. So I am mean, looking forward to this talk. It's one that I've heard a couple different times, I believe, um, but there's always, always a, a bunch of questions that I have afterwards. So I'm really looking forward to the Q&A on this one particularly. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, you can either put them in the Q&A or in the chat box. Um, that way we can record those questions and I can pass them on to Christine later uh, if we're not able to get to those. We're gonna let uh, Dr. Jones go until about 6.30 and then open it up to your questions. So in the meantime, everybody is gonna be muted. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else ground rules that I need to cover. I think that's pretty much it to kick us off. Uh, Keith, do you want to go ahead and introduce Christine for the third time? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Noah. Uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. And for those of you that are joining us uh, as a repeat uh, watcher, thank you for coming back. Uh, again, our guest is Dr. Christine Jones, one of the world's preeminent soil microbiologists from Australia. Uh, uh, Christine has uh, been uh, a frequent speaker in the United States, so I would say over the last four or five years, especially. And, you know, Christine, I don't know exactly what made you famous over here, but, but for me, what, what really put you on my radar and why we really were excited about, you know, getting you to write for our Soil Health Resource Guide, it, it's this topic right here. Uh, your article that you had on your website entitled Nitrogen, the Double-Edged Sword <clears throat> was, was just really a game changer for myself and, and lots of other people. That's one of the first talks that I heard you give over here in the States uh, and really before I had ever met you or ever knew you. And so your, uh, your thoughts on this concept of nitrogen uh, to me is just, it's, it's some of your best work, I think, and it's uh, certainly some of your most widely known work. So I'm really excited to, to have the have our folks who are tuned in here, uh, the ones who will be, you know, the many thousands who will be watching this uh, on our YouTube channel later on. It's a great topic, so pay close attention, ask lots of questions, we're in for a great ride. So Dr. Jones, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Keith, uh, for that. Fantastic introduction, and uh, thank you very much, Noah, for your great introduction as well. And it's always, uh, honestly, just an enormous pleasure to be um, to part to be part of the Green Cover uh, team and to have this opportunity to talk about one of my favourite topics, uh, which is nitrogen. So, if I can, we're going to have a perfect day today where everything is going to go absolutely. Um, flawless. Yeah. It's going to be a flawless, flawless presentation. It's going to be a flawless presentation. That's it now. Um, so what you can see in front of you there is a dinitrogen molecule. In other words, two atoms of nitrogen bound together by a triple bond. And this is the form that nitrogen occurs in, in the Earth's atmosphere. And I'm going to talk about that um, in more detail in a, in a little moment. Um, last week, we talked about phosphorus fertilizer and I, the points that I made about phosphorus is that it's relatively immobile in the soil. In other words, wherever you put it, that's pretty much where it stays. Only about 10 to 15% of the phosphorus fertilizer that is applied is taken up by plants in the year of application which means that 85 to 90% of our fertilizer additions are immobilized. In other words, they're, they're fixed in the soil, they're bound, phosphate has a negative charge, it's highly reactive, and it is going to bind with elements in the soil that have a positive charge. 
such as iron and aluminum. Did you hear me how well I said that? <laughs> and, uh, and in alkaline soils with calcium. And even though a lot of the phosphorus that farmers have added to their soils has not been taken up by plants, provided they haven't lost the soil through erosion, they have now actually formed a large phosphorus bank. And that phosphorus is going to be able to be accessed at some later stage using uh, microbial intermediaries. And we'll talk about how we're going to activate the soil microbiome. So you haven't actually lost that unless you have lost the soil. And if you've been using phosphorus fertilizer, the good news is that most of it is still there um, and um, you can access it later. The news with nitrogen is not so good. Nitrogen fertilizers, so I'm talking about inorganic forms of nitrogen now like nitrate and ammonium. It's highly mobile in soil. It doesn't actually bind to soil particles and stay there. Only about 10 to 40% of the nitrogen that's supplied as fertilizer is taken up by plants, usually because they're just not able to take up such massive amounts of nitrogen, particularly if it's applied like pre-plant. Um, in fact, sometimes um, in Australian situations, we've seen where quite a lot of uh, nitrogen has been like preloaded sometimes like say six weeks before a crop is planted and we go and uh, measure the soil the day that the crop's being planted and none of the nitrogen that was preloaded is there. <laughs> it's all gone by the time the crop is even planted and then that of course the seedlings come up and they're nitrogen deficient. But even under ideal conditions, somewhere between 10 to 40% is taken up by plants. The other 60 to 90% goes somewhere else um, into the water, up into the air and it's gonna cause a problem. Uh, it's a very significant environmental pollutant all around the world. And nitrogen is very rapidly transformed. It occurs in several different uh, chemical formations and it can move from one of those to another one very, very quickly. And it does not, the nitrogen fertilizer that you apply to your soil does not accumulate and form a nitrogen bank like a phosphorus fertilizer does. In fact, the more fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer you, you use as a general rule, the less uh, nitrogen you have in your soils. Now, well, if we're looking at this in terms of uh, energy use efficiency and um, you know, fossil fuel use, all those kinds of things, the production of nitrogen fertilizer is, has a, is a very highly energy demanding process and it uses six times more energy um, like per tonne of fertiliser than the production of phosphorus fertiliser. And producing nitrogen fertiliser also emits large amounts of methane, which is another greenhouse gas. So if it is possible for anything to be more detrimental than phosphorus fertiliser, then nitrogen fertiliser is it. So why do we use it? Well, Keith, uh, in his introduction um, to last week's webinar on the phosphorus paradox said, we're never going to run out of nitrogen. And that is just so true. But 78% of the atmosphere is dinitrogen, which is that molecule that I showed right at the beginning, two nitrogen atoms uh, joined, covalently joined with a triple bond. That means in metric terms that we have 78,000 tonnes of nitrogen gas sitting above every hectare of land. And I did do the math on that, that equates to 70 million pounds per acre. So we have 70 million pounds of dinitrogen gas sitting above every acre of land. There is really no need to go out and buy it, especially when we see all the downsides of using uh, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. But the problem is that all of that nitrogen that's in the atmosphere that dinitrogen is relatively inert and it's not directly available to plants. Sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, um, legumes, for example, can fix nitrogen. Well, legumes can't fix nitrogen. Legumes um, can be, form a symbiotic relationship with rhizobia bacteria that can fix nitrogen. So it's always going to be a microbe that's in association with the plant, um, not the plant itself. And so as with phosphorus, as we discussed last week, it's going to be microbes and their enzymes. It's going to be microbial enzymes that are going to be the key to accessing nitrogen. 
And in the case, um, in this case, the microbes are called diazotrophs. The diazotrophs are bacteria and archaea that are able to break that triple bond between two nitrogen atoms and actually convert that relatively inert dinitrogen, which is why they're called diazotrophs, into a plant utilize uh, into a plant um, available form. But the trick here is that diazotrophs utilize the enzyme that they use is called nitrogenase. There are a whole range of nitrogenases. Sometimes they're called dinitrogenase and sometimes they're called dinitrogenase reductase. But basically it's a group of enzymes called nitrogenases. And those, um, that is the enzyme that breaks that bond in the inert dinitrogen gas, but nitrogenase, the enzyme that microbes use, is inhibited by oxygen. So the only place in the soil or in a plant where diazotropes are able to uh, break that triple bond and convert inert dinitrogen gas into nitrogen in a plant available form is in specialised what we call microaerobic fixation sites. In other words, microaerobic means there is a little bit of oxygen there, but not a lot. It's not anoxic and it's not anaerobic, but it's not aerobic either. It a, has a low partial pressure of oxygen. And these specialised fixation sites are inside riser sheaths and inside water stable aggregates. So if we want to know whether our, our plant community or our soils are um, able to fix nitrogen or able to support free living nitrogen fixing bacteria and archaea, we just need to look to see whether the plants have riser sheaths or whether water stable aggregates are forming in that soil. And if you are building topsoil, if, if you have evidence when you go out with a spade, dig a hole, like visual soil assessment um, is going to tell you a lot more than sending a sample to a lab. You need to look to see are these things happening in my soil? Do my plants have riser sheaths? Is whatever it is that I'm doing, is it forming water stable aggregates in this soil? Can I see evidence of aggregation? And if you can, if, if soil building is taking place, then nitrogen fixing is taking place because as I explained last week, the humic molecules that are involved in that whole soil building process are a combination of carbon and nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen in the same molecule. So you know that nitrogen fixing is happening if you're building soils. And that's probably all you really need to know because that will certainly tell you more than a lab test will tell you. The bad news is that the formation of riser sheaths on our plants and the formation of water stable aggregates is inhibited by the use of high analysis inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. What do I mean by inorganic nitrogen fertilizer? I'm talking about things like nitrates, um, ammonium um, products like anhydrous ammonia or um, urea or nitram, now, anything that's got any form of nitrate or ammonium in it is going to be an inorganic nitrogen fertiliser. And if a lot of that is applied, and I'll talk about at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll talk about what I mean by a lot, because in actual fact, a little bit can be stimulatory. Um, it's one of those things where the concentration effect is very important. But if, if people are using high amounts, and I mean, if you're using anything, you know, over, over 50 pounds per acre, it's too much. And it is actually going to inhibit riser sheets formation and the formation of water stable aggregates. So then natural free living nitrogen fixing can't happen. So in other words, the more we use it, the more we use nitrogen fertilizer, the more we lose it. And there's uh, plenty of research evidence around that. And the unfortunate thing about the research, there has been millions of dollars of money go into research into nitrogen dynamics in agricultural soils. Every year, there's probably millions of dollars spent. And every year, farmers around the world spend over $100 billion on nitrogen fertilisers. And all this research and all this money that's spent on fertilisers is mostly under conditions that are not supporting the activities of free living nitrogen fixing bacteria and archaea. So if you're reading a paper about uh, nitrogen dynamics in agricultural soils, and well, for a start, if synthetic 
or high analysis inorganic nitrogen fertilizer has been applied, then what you're looking at is irrelevant to a situation that's going to be supportive for free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. If, you're, if the research was conducted in soils that have been kept in storage for a long time and they're not biologically active, the results of that research are going to be um, virtually meaningless. The soil, if the uh, research is being conducted in a monoculture, the results of that research are going to be virtually meaningless. In other words, we can probably discard about 99.9% .9 of the research that's ever been undertaken into nitrogen dynamics in agricultural soils. So we have to go back to the uh, to, to ground zero and start again um, and, and look at this with a totally, like we do need to start with a blank canvas and figure out what is actually going on in our soils. Now, I showed this photograph last week or the week before, but it's about, this is what a lot of scientists will see when they're studying plants in the glasshouse or in the laboratory. They'll see plants that have clean white roots like that, which means that they're not looking at plants in a situation that is going to support free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in archaea because there is nowhere in that environment for nitrogenase, the enzyme that is going to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a plant available form. There is nowhere in that environment for nitrogenase to be able to function. Remember, it's inhibited by oxygen. So if we have uh, clean white roots like that, no riser sheets, um, it, there is not going to be any um, nitrogenase active. So here are some photographs taken in the field. This is a fence line comparison. On one side, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a farmer that has been using a nitrogenous fertilizer under an oat crop. And on the right-hand side, we have the same soil, um, the same crop planted at the same time, everything the same, uh, where they have not used any nitrogen fertilizer. And you can see the difference on one side, we have bare roots. Um, it's going to be lots of oxygen around those roots and it's not possible for free living nitrogen fixing bacteria to help that crop. On the right hand side, we have the formation of aggregates around the roots. You'll also notice there's fungal hyphae in that photo and fungi are very important. Um, they're plant associated fungi, they're supported through that fungal energy channel that I'm gonna mention a little bit later. Uh, very important for creating the structures in soil that we need for free living nitrogen fixing to take place. This was um, something that really brought the whole issue home to me very, very clearly. This is uh, Sarah and Ilka in Finland and they were converting their farm to organics and they were doing a trial with something like 20 different organic fertilizers that were all carbon-based fertilizer, like different kinds of compost. And we were looking at the roots of the wheat plants to see whether these fertilizers, these biological fertilizers, what difference they were making to the riser sheets on the plants. And what we found was that every single one of the 20 treatments that we looked at had um, beautiful riser sheaths on the crown roots that were come, the roots were coming out of the crowns of the plants. But below the seed, all of the roots were completely uh, white and clean and had no soil sticking to them whatsoever. Hello, it's just done that to me, jumped over. <laughs> Keith's given me instructions on how to operate this when it happens. Okay, so we, we have our, uh, our wheat seed here and here, and these amazingly clean white roots, seminal roots coming down from the seed. We didn't wash these plants, just dug them out, shook the soil off them, and these beautiful riser sheets on the crown roots. And it was, I, I've never seen it like that before. And here's another one, here's the seed here, these are incredibly clean roots and these beautiful riser sheets here, all on the same plant. And I was just totally puzzled. I couldn't figure it out because they were converting to organic. So I assumed that they weren't going to be using any nitrogen fertilizer. And we went back and had some lunch and talked about it. And in the end, I said to Sarah, you know, look, you haven't used any nitrogen fertilizer here, have you? And she said, oh yes, the scientist that was um, helping us set up this trial and conduct this research in a way that was going to give us meaningful results, said that because these biological fertilizers that we were using, which was a range of different kinds of compost, had different 
carbon to nitrogen ratios. And in order to take that out of the experiment as a factor, we needed to apply nitrogen to everything to equalize the amount of nitrogen in the plot. So it, all of the uh, treatments had 80 units of N placed under the seed. So if you want to see what nitrogen placed under the seed does to wheat roots, there, there it is, absolute classic. Here are the seeds, nitrogen placed under the seed. Uh, there is no possibility for any nitrogen fixing to happen in that environment. But up here where the crown roots are in contact with the various forms of compost that they were using, beautiful riser sheaths and there will be free living nitrogen fixes living inside those riser sheaths because it's a micro aerobic environment, a low partial pressure of oxygen. And in fact, if nitrogen hadn't been placed under these seeds, there would have been riser sheaths on these roots here as well. <clears throat> so in the secrets of the soil sociobiome two weeks ago, I talked about the fungal energy channel and I showed this photograph, I think I've probably showed it every time, I might even show it again next week. I just love it so much. So over here on the left, we have a plant root and on the right, we have soil particles. And this is what we can, we would be able to see if we used a microscope to look in underneath or look into a riser sheath. We'd see all these fungi, um, these fungal hyphae that are extending from the plant root out to the riser sheath. And of course, they're helping to bind the soil particles that are um, clinging to the roots to, um, to create that riser sheath in the first place. But this space inside here, this is going to be a low oxygen environment. It's gonna be low partial pressure of oxygen in here. And they're going to be literally trillions of bacteria and archaea, all feeding on root exudates, but also even some of them will be forming biofilms on the hyphae of these fungi. Um, and it's a very, very rich environment for free living nitrogen fixes. Now, if you think about it, we have this belief that number one, we have to add nitrogen for plants to grow because we know that they do need nitrogen. And number two, that legumes um, are the only plants that form a relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria. Well, if you really think about that, if legumes were the only plants that were able to form a relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria, they would probably be about the only plants that would be on the planet because no other plants would be able to survive. And yet you can go to plenty of uh, environments where, and look into the plant community and see there are no legumes there and everything else is nice and green and everything else is growing perfectly well. So obviously every single green plant has the capacity to form a relationship with free living nitrogen fixing bacteria. Otherwise it couldn't be green because the chlorophyll, the pigment that makes a plant green is actually part of a protein complex. So it can't be green. Um, unless or can't contain chlorophyll, unless the plant is able to access nitrogen from somewhere. So the plant is going to access that nitrogen through microbial intermediaries, and they need a specialised environment in, in which to thrive. They need an environment where there's lots of energy coming in, and that energy is going to come through that fungal, um, fungal energy channel through plant root exudates, and they need uh, some kind of a structure like a riser sheath or a water stable aggregate that's a root supported water stable aggregate. In other words, it's gonna be fine feeder roots coming into that, into that aggregate and, and actually building that aggregate. Um, and in those environments, the plant is going to be able to obtain all of the nitrogen that it needs. And I think I also used this slide last week. This is just the, um, the brown bit down the center is actually a plant root and all the creamy, um, the network here are the high feet of, in this case, ectomycorrhizal fungi, but there are a lot of the other fungi that are in soil we can't see with the naked eye or even under a microscope, we can't see them. And yet this is what it's going to look like in the soil when the fungal energy channel is open and operating. So these fungi, these fungal hyphae are going to be taking energy that was derived from photosynthesis that the plant has channeled down um, to its roots and it's pumping out into the soil sociobiome through these fungal hyphae, it's going to be taking that energy out to colonies of bacteria and archaea that are going to be able to um, fix nitrogen in water stable aggregates. And so the plant associated fungi in this fungal energy channel are going to be transporting energy 
to nitrogen fixing bacteria in archaea because remember like that uh, production of the nitrogenase enzyme and the breaking of that triple bond actually requires quite a lot of energy. And they're also going to be transporting organic nitrogen back to plant roots. So there was a question came up, I'm not sure whether it was last week or the week before, about are fungi able to fix atmospheric nitrogen? Well, the answer is no, but fungi are very, very important. Plant associated fungi are very important for bringing nitrogen back to plants and they will bring it back in the organic form. They're going to bring it back as amino acids. And the reason they transport it as amino acids is because that is the most efficient way, um, energy efficient way to transport them. And then once they're inside the plant, the plant can very easily assemble amino acids into complete proteins. It doesn't take much energy for the plant to make all the proteins that it needs from amino acids. If the plant takes up inorganic nitrogen, as we are led to believe by just about every textbook that you read about nitrogen, will say that plants prefer um, to assimilate nitrogen in usually as nitrate. Nitrate would be the preferred option and then uh, ammonium would be the second preference. Well, that's actually not true. That's only because people have looked in environments where that's really been the only options that plants have had. If they take inorganic nitrogen up into the leaves and the stems, they then have to um, produce a whole lot more uh, carbohydrate to add to that nitrogen, that inorganic nitrogen, to transform it into, organ into amino acids and into protein requires a, is a huge metabolic cost to the plant to transform inorganic nitrogen into protein and often the plants are not able to do it. So the nitrogen remains in an inorganic form in the plants. And that's when we have livestock that uh, suffer from nitrate poisoning, uh, or we have even um, issues, metabolic issues in livestock from consuming plants that are very high in nitrates. We actually don't want any nitrate in soil, in plants, in our animals or in our water. And the way to avoid having nitrate in any of those environments is not to use it in the first place. And if we are supporting that whole fungal energy channel and that soil sociobiome, even though the bacteria in the archaea are going to fix nitrogen as firstly as ammonia, and then very rapidly convert that to ammonium, it is then going to go into uh, the microbial biomass. It's going to be part of the bodies of all the things that live in soil. And it's going to be in that microbial biomass in the amino form. So it's going to be organic. It won't show up on a soil test uh, as, as available N. And I have seen multiple soil tests where uh, the soil has virtually no detectable N a leaf test will show that there's virtually no inorganic N in the leaves. And if an agronomist looked at that soil test and that leaf test, they would say this plant is not capable of producing anything. And yet those particular plants uh, will have some of the highest grain yields in the district and the highest protein content in the grain in that district. And that is because in the soil and in the plant, the nitrogen was in an organic form. It's not leachable, it's not mobile, unless it's transported by fungi, and that is the form we want all of our nitrogen to be in. And it will be if we are, all we need to do as farmers is support that fungal energy channel. I've also said multiple times in the past that 85 to 90% of plant nutrient acquisition is microbially mediated. It's because I like using lots of big words, but even when we apply uh, synthetic fertilisers to soil, as a general rule, they cannot get into plants unless there's some kind of transformation takes place in the microbiomes. The microbes are just so incredibly important <clears throat> for plant nutrient acquisition. And as I mentioned last week or the week before, we need lots and lots of different kinds of microbes living in all the different um, compartments, if you like, of, of the soil and the plants we want. We want microbes around the rhizosphere, we want microbes in the stems and the leaves, the fruits, the flowers, and we actually want to incorporate, we want the plant to incorporate microbes into the seed and carry those through to the next generation in its core microbiome. And ideally, a lot of those microbes would be <clears throat> bacteria and archaea 
that have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen. And they are going to interact with a whole lot of other microbes that are in that sociobiome because it's never a case of one single microbe acting alone. And this has been the issue with, a, there has been research, there has been a lot of research into uh, things like, um, as, um, oh, name's just gone out of my head. <laughs> um, it's not a Zotobacter, it's Aspirillum. Aspirillum, Aspirillum, I think that's right. Um, gosh, that date of birth is really having, <laughs> Never mind, Christine. Uh, there's been a lot of research into trying to isolate individual nitrogen fixing bacteria or even individual um, clones, if you like, or isolates of some that are better able to fix nitrogen than others, even within one species of nitrogen fixing bacteria. But a lot of that has not come to anything because you can't just apply one species of bacteria to soil or one species of bacteria to, to, to seeds or to plants and expect it to be able to function. It requires that bacteria workers teams so bacteria and archaea and fungi, everything that lives in soil works together. It is a sociobiome. We just need to create the right conditions for all of those bacteria to work together and we'll get the desired result. And we have to remember what I have already mentioned before is that we want different kinds of plants that have different functional traits. In other words, they come from different plant families because if the microbiomes of all the plants that are growing together in a community are similar, in other words, if we have a monoculture of something, then the microbiomes have a negative feedback effect on nutrient acquisition. A microbiome will recognize that the neighboring microbiomes are the same as it, and it will not cooperate with those neighboring microbiomes and will be very competitive for nutrients. If we have dissimilar microbiomes, in other words, we have plants with different functional traits, they're from different plant families um, growing together in a community and the microbiomes of the plant detect that the others around it are different to itself or dissimilar to itself, there will be a positive feedback on nutrient acquisition and plants will actually exchange nutrients through the common mycorrhizal network and will help each other. Um, so some plants that are able to, like there might be some plants with deep tap roots that are able to access minerals from the subsoil, while others have shallow fibrous root systems, um, not able to access those same particularly trace elements. Those things can be shared through the common mycorrhizal network provided the plants have dissimilar microbiomes. So it's really important that we look at those functional groups. And in our mixtures, this is our, some plants that you may put in a pasture, but um, in our cover crop mixes or in our companions, we, we need to look at having uh, different plant families to obtain the best outcome in terms of nitrogen fixing. So we could have a plant community. I know that there are legumes in that particular um, diagrams. We have plantain, red clover, chicory, pea, ryegrass, swiss, and which you will call alfalfa, uh, beets, fescue, dandelion, and coxwood in that diagram. I'd like to see a lot more diversity than that, but it's um, that's a start. And quite a few of those things are legumes of oh, well, red clover, pea, um, and alfalfa are, are legumes. But we could take the legumes out of that system and just have, if we have at least four plant families in there, it will be equally as good at fixing nitrogen. In fact, diverse systems with no legumes, provided we have four functional groups, at least four functional groups, will fix more nitrogen than uh, a system with legumes. So people talk about how many species should I have in a mix? And you know, maybe six species in a mix or eight species in a mix. And I say, well, if they're all legumes, it probably will have a negative effect. Um, you want, you know, four plant families and two species from each or something like that. So here's a practical example of that. This is, um, I saw this in a cover crop demonstration on a research farm in Ontario, in Canada. And there were strips, probably uh, about 20 yards wide, I guess, of a whole lot of different cover crop species planted as monocultures and then mix, mixes of those right up to something like I think a 12 way mix. So in this example here, we're looking at just radish 
grown on its own. And all of these plots actually received a base application of an MPK fertiliser. So it has been fertilised, but it's very nitrogen deficient. And right next to it, on the right hand side, was, yeah, I've done it again, was a mix of radish with, or planted at the same time, everything the same, radish with a little bit of oats and sunflower and phacelia. So you can see the radish leaves in here are all beautiful and green. I'm sure you all recognize oats. There's a phacelia plant here and sunflower here. So what we have is not a huge amount of other things in there, just a smattering of other kinds of plants in there, but we actually have four plant families in that particular case. So even though in this research, they were looking at all these different combinations and different mixes, there wasn't any emphasis on uh, functional dissimilarity. It just so happened that in this particular case, there were four plant families in this mix and there is no um, obvious signs of lack of nitrogen. And the other interesting thing about this photograph is there are no legumes in this mix. So we have sunflower in Asteraceae, oats in Poaceae, radish in Brassicaceae, and Phacelia in Baraginaceae. We don't have any legumes in there and there is no nitrogen deficiency. So if I just splice those photos and put them side by side, you can see the huge difference. Plants were much larger um, and obviously not nitrogen deficient, and yet the whole trial received the same basal application of nitrogen. So high analysis fertilizers are merely a substitute for plant diversity. So it's not really going to be that hard for us to wean off nitrogen once we start looking at plant. <laughs> once we start looking at plant diversity. I think I need to get a new mouse. We're having a mouse plague here in, um, in, uh, in Australia at the moment, so maybe I can go and get one of those. Um, the antibiodiversity experiment, I know I mention it every time, it's just because there is so much good research has been done there and so much great information. But when they look at one, two, four, eight, or 16 different plant species and four functional groups, the functional groups were grasses, legumes, tall herbs, and short herbs, and the tall and short herbs were non-leguminous. And they looked at biomass production, beneficial insects, soil microbial activity, water balance, soil carbon, nitrogen. Um, and this is just an overview of the site. But the one particular bit that, of this experiment that I want to talk about today is the nitrogen part of it. So with those different uh, numbers of plant species, remember all, all four functional groups. So eight plant species, for example, was two species from each of four functional groups. 16 plant species was four species from each of four functional groups, not just any 16 plants. And this is a multifactorial experiment where they've looked at zero, 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, it was actually kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, but kilograms per hectare and pounds per acre are roughly equivalent. And it's multifactorial. So you might have just a monoculture with one species with no nitrogen or 100 pounds per acre or 200 pounds per acre, right up to 16 plant species with no nitrogen, 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And what they found in this experiment was that if they had eight or 16 plant species with no nitrogen produced more biomass, like it produced a greater plant yield than one or two species with 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. If you have a monoculture with 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, it is not able to produce as much as a diverse polyculture with no nitrogen. And this result has been replicated around the world in many, many different experiments. There's research underway in Ireland at the moment, for example, um, looking at, um, well, mostly at pastures for, for sheep and for dairy and for beef cattle. And they're finding there that they can completely eliminate nitrogen through plant diversity. In fact, even something like um, 350 kilos per, 350 kilos of N per hectare, which is something like 760 kilograms of urea. Well, 
per hectare. Uh, like let's say nearly 800 pounds of urea per acre. Nearly 800 pounds of urea per acre cannot produce as much yield as having um, a, a plant community with four functional groups. I think this is really, I, I keep saying it and I'm gonna say it again, the way of the future is going to be uh, polycultures in every aspect of agricultural production. And I'll talk more about that next week when I'm talking about orchards and vineyards. So if levels of microbial diversity have been uh, reduced in soil through, think of all the things that we do in agriculture, bare fallows, we don't have any photosynthesis. So we're not supporting any microbes. We use high rates of nitrogen fertilizer that we know throw the soil completely out of balance, inhibit root exudation. And if we've inhibited root exudation, then we're not supporting microbes. Fungicides, what are fungicides gonna to do to the fungal energy channel? <laughs> Obliterate it. Um, pesticides are highly toxic. We really don't wanna be using pesticides in agriculture anyway, if we can avoid it. And inappropriate grazing management, which I'm you know, not really going into in these webinars because we're talking about cropping situations. But, um, you know, if we are removing all the photosynthetic capacity of a pasture by overgrazing it, then there's not going to be enough carbon being channeled to the soil uh, to support the soil microbiome. So within any of those situations, and those situations occur throughout the world in nearly all of our agricultural soil, biological nitrogen fixation is going to be inhibited. And that is why farmers have had to resort to using inorganic nitrogen fertilizer because they have not um, supported the natural process in soil and probably haven't realized that even something like a bare fallow, for example, is going to have a hugely detrimental effect on the nitrogen dynamics in your soil. So how can we increase microbial diversity? In other words, how can we go the other way? Well, we just need to reverse all of those things. We need to make sure that we have year long green, make sure that we never have bare ground. And we want that year long green to be biodiverse. So we want a minimum of four plant families in our biodiverse year long green ground cover. And we can also, uh, particularly in the transitioning process when we're weaning off nitrogen with them use biostimulants, they're particularly effective on the seed because they're going to mimic the microbial signaling that will take place in a diverse sociobiome. So as I've explained in previous webinars, plants use, micro, um, use chemical signals or biochemical signals to um, communicate with soil microbes. Microbes use biochemical signals to communicate with plants and microbes use biochemical signals to communicate with each other. And those biochemical signals are going to be very rich in mediums like uh, in the gut of an earthworm or in a fermented compost or something like that, we can just take a dilute extract of those kinds of materials and we will be taking out the chemical signaling molecules or the auto inducers, if you like, and applying those to seeds. We're not going to be applying microbes to seeds. We're just going to be applying the signaling molecules from microbes to seeds. And the seeds will interpret those as um, they'll interpret that as they're in a microbially rich environment and they'll produce lots of exudates to support those microbes and just kickstart the whole microbial diversity, um, just kickstart that whole process of plants supporting microbes and microbes supporting plants. If you have been using a lot of nitrogen fertilizer for quite a while, you're going to have very low levels of natural um, free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in your soil. They do take a while to replicate. With phosphorus, it's not an issue um, because the microbes that are involved in phosphorus acquisition can very rapidly build up in soil. It just takes the free living nitrogen fixes a little while, something like about three years. So if you have been using a lot and you don't want your yields to decline, in the first year, it's best if you just reduce it by about 20%. But also, if you don't put it on the seed, and don't put it anywhere near the seed. So you're going to reduce it, but you're also going to uh, not put it in the soil. You'll use it as a foliar, uh, or you will use an organic form of nitrogen like um, fish hydrolysate or something like that. 
In year two, you can reduce it another 30%. In year three, another 50%. So let's say you were using 100 pounds per acre. In the first year, you just go down to 80 pounds per acre. In the second year, you could drop it to 50. In the third year, down to 25 pounds per acre. And then indefinitely, if you feel that your plants do need a little bit of inorganic nitrogen, you can use five pounds per acre with no detrimental effects on the soil microbiome. So just to give you an example, five pounds of N per acre would be say 25 pounds per acre of sulfate of ammonia because it's 20% um, it's nitrogen. So you need to look at the product you're using and what percentage of it is nitrogen. So when I say five pounds of N per acre, I mean of the N itself. And sulfate of ammonia is quite a useful inorganic nitrogen fertilizer to use because a lot of uh, soils are slightly deficient in sulfur, especially if you're a long way from the sea. So it doesn't hurt. I'm not saying that all inorganic fertilizers are bad and if they're used at very low rates, they're not bad. But what we, have, what we are seeing in agricultural systems around the world is that in the early days, well, I don't know, maybe you know the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s, people were using relatively small amounts of nitrogen fertilizer and now they're using massive amounts. So over time, the amount that's being applied has been increased and increased and increased and that's because plants haven't been responding to it. So people have been put in a situation of putting more and more on, trying to actually get a response or even to maintain yield. So the idea is that we need to cut back, cut back, cut back, but you don't have to eliminate it completely. And if you can find amino forms of nitrogen, for example, fish hydrolysate, um, they're not going to inhibit the functioning of the soil sociobiome. But again, don't need to apply a whole heap. I think the, you know, the application rate for fish hydrolysate will be something like 10 litres per hectare, which is probably about 10 pints per acre. You know, we're not talking about putting gallons of this stuff on. And always use plant leaf tests to see whether your plants need nitrogen or not. You, and if they do, apply it as a foliar, only if they need it. And so over time, by cutting back, by introducing diversity, by making sure you never have bare soil, um, all of these things, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You need to put all the pieces in place and you need to keep and you need to monitor and see how you're going. And if you do leaf tests and your plants need nitrogen, then apply it because we don't want you to be losing yield. But if you apply it as a foliar, it's not going to have an effect on the soil microbiome um, and plants can take it up through their leaves. We just want to keep everything fully functional and we just want to transition nice and smoothly into a situation where you don't need to use any at all. Um, and you'll, build, you'll be building soil. That'll be one of the great things. Um, you need to go out with a spade, dig holes, look to see whether your soil is aggregating, look for riser sheaths, all these positive things that over time will give you, uh, as a farmer, incredibly positive feedback about how your soils are going and how everything is working together as it should in your soils. And you, as a person, will feel more connected to what it is that you're doing, rather than just going out, um, applying lots of fertiliser, then having to use fungicides, then having to use insecticides, then worrying about all the pests and diseases and the cost associated with producing a crop. And, you know, what if the price falls? What if it's cost me more to put this crop in than what I get back for it? Um, it it's a very stressful situation. And that situation can be just turned around um, to one that is a very, very pleasant experience to actually see that you're building soil and that your plants don't need any inorganic fertilisers. So that's the end of my uh, formal part of my presentation. And um, I'm now open for questions. I don't know why that, that one picture gets me every time, but the, the, I believe it was the wheat with the nitrogen underneath is just such a telling image. I mean, it, you know, they say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. I don't know how you can get around that. I, I just love that picture. So thanks for, I, yeah, thanks for putting it in there. I appreciate that. You can show yeah, that anytime. <laughs> it, it comes, I, I use it every time though. Whenever I talk nitro, nitrogen, I can't help using that one. But I mean, you could, I could show a fence line effect. Like this soil came from this side of the fence and this came from that side. 
And uh, I mean, it would also be easy to manipulate that. You know, you could choose where you, where you did it. But we, we dug those wheat plants out of every single one of those 20 test plots and every single one had that same thing. I was like, what is going on here? And I kept saying to Sarah, you know, have you, did you use something, some kind of, um, you know, like a herbicide that would have a residual effect or some kind of poison in this soil? We just couldn't figure it out. Well, the poison is nitrogen. <laughs> Well, I'm going to go ahead. We've got plenty of questions to get to, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, what I wanted to try and do this evening is try and bunch some of these questions up so we can get to as many as possible. So if you're typing a question out and I don't address it, read it exactly uh, the way that you say it, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is get things more on uh, themes here this evening. But I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, Shorty said, can you explain what a funny protein is? Yeah, a funny protein is not a complete protein. That was a, a term that Jerry Brunetti came up with. So a funny protein is uh, when a plant takes up inorganic nitrogen, but is not able to complete the process of converting that into a protein, it remains in the plant as in an inorganic form. And what happens is that if you send um, leaves off, or you know, a plant tissue test, I don't, I'm not sure what you call it, you know, so if you send it to the lab, to have uh, like a forage analysis or something done on it, all they are going to do is measure the amount of nitrogen that's in that plant and multiply it by a factor. In Australia, the factor is 6.25. So they will say every unit of nitrogen is equivalent to 6.25 units of protein. So say, just say, for example, there was 2% nitrogen there, it's gonna come out at you know 14% or something protein. But that nitrogen might not be protein. And so that's what we call funny, funny protein. It's not, it's what the lab will tell you it was protein, but they didn't measure protein, they just measured nitrogen. We see it time and time again, particularly in forage samples where farmers have used a lot of urea or something to try and get their grass to grow. And the grass will grow taller and it will look green, but the livestock don't do very well on it. They're in fact going to do better on shorter grass that has got complete proteins in it. So yeah, that's what funny protein is. Jerry Brunetti came up with that term. <laughs> okay, uh, I have two questions here in regards to sap yeah. analysis. John Kemp champions plant sap tests as a more accurate look into what the plant contains in nutrients. Do you have any opinion on sap tests? Um, they're used pretty widely in uh, like intensive horticultural situations, for example, in, you know, in Europe where you've got big tunnels and you're producing thousands of lettuces and tomatoes and things like every day. And it's, it's a way of uh, very closely monitoring what's happening in the plant. In fact, in some of those situations, there'll be a sap test done basically every day to find out what's going on in the plant. And it does give you a more immediate idea of whether that plant actually needs something at that time. I think that if you're focusing on the folk, on the fungal energy channel and getting the soil sociobiome up and running and you're looking at to see where the plants have got rhizos sheaths and where the aggregates are forming, you don't need um, a constant, you know, looking at sap. I think in a horticultural situation, maybe yes. I value horticultural crops would justify that. But if you're growing, um, you know, just field crops or pastures, I think a leaf test is perfectly fine. Albert says, can you clarify that if you have companion plants without a legume, that the bacteria is still fixing nitrogen and making it available for the plants? Can I confirm that? Um, well, yes, the research shows that in fact, if we have four functional groups without legumes, we'll fix, the soil will fix more nitrogen or the, um, the soil sociobiome will fix more nitrogen than um, one that has legumes in it. That's what the research shows. We're better off without legumes, but I mean, we've used legumes. Legumes in a way to me, are almost like a de facto form of nitrogen fertilizer. We've got a system that's not working. We've usually got a monoculture and we'll put a legume in there to, um, because the bacteria that are associated with that legume can fix nitrogen. That kind of gets us out of a situation where things aren't working properly. But if we're in a situation where everything is working properly and we've got enough functional diversity in our plant community, we honestly do not need legumes in there and they in fact can be detrimental 
to that to that whole process. They're not necessary when we have everything functioning properly. So kind of along the same lines, uh, can bacteria feed nitrogen to the plants without fungi? How can we increase the fungi in, in our soils? Uh, and is there an ideal ratio that you're trying to aim for? Yeah, we talked about fungal to bacterial ratios last week, I think, or the week before. I would definitely like to see a ratio of more than one to one. I'd like to see fungi to bacteria being more like two to one. Um, but in answer to the question, bacteria can definitely feed nitrogen directly to plants and there'll be, there'll be bacteria all around the roots um, in a healthy soil. There'll be biofilms of bacteria all around plant roots, particularly the young roots, um, the young actively growing roots. Um, if you've listened to any of James White's webinars, and I think you've had Professor James White actually with Green Cover has presented a webinar on how plant roots can internalize bacteria that contain nitrogen and strip them of that nitrogen. And then that's the rhizophagy cycle that he talks about. So that is one way that plants can obtain nitrogen from bacteria, but they can also internalize nitrogen fixing bacteria and just maintain them within the entire plant, like in the leaves or somewhere that don't have to be down in the roots as um, nitrogen fixing endophytes. Okay. Uh, are the genitrials measuring plant biomass or crop yield? And I'm going to add on to that. Is there a good place to go um, for the research on those genitrials? Is there some YouTube videos or anything? Yeah, if you just put that into Google, just put uh, Yana Biodiversity Experiment YouTube. There is a little YouTube video. I think it's about seven or eight minutes. It's absolutely fantastic. It's one of my go-to um, yeah, if somebody wants to know about that trial, I say just check out this video um, and the screen times that I use are actually from that. I will, I'll put a little side note here. If you're watching this on YouTube, I will try and put a link for that in the description so that you can go to that video as well. Okay, I'll send you that link now and you can put that into the description. Good idea. Perfect. I think Keith's already found it by the look of it. He's, he's on it. And I think it is also, it's in English and German. And it might be in French as well. I think it's in a couple of languages. Uh, Andy says, I like that you've suggested to reduce nitrogen a little each year. Uh, how else can we mitigate the risk of lower yields in the transition period? Yeah, well, I, th I think the thing is, uh, like diversity is going to be the first thing. Always keep the soil covered you know, think about uh, incorporating a few companions in your crop, all of, all of that, and then just cut back slowly on the end, but do do those leaf tests and just check to make sure that it's in the optimum range. And if it's not, you will have to use a foliar. I would recommend fish hydrolysate as a foliar. It's an amino form of N. In other words, it's not inorganic N. Um, and it's very beneficial for plants in other ways as well. And I don't have any shares in a fish hydrolysate fertilizer factory. <laughs> I just, you know, from experience, I see that that's a great way of getting any into plants without doing any damage whatsoever. It's very beneficial. So yeah, just keep monitoring it and yeah, try and try and use an amino form of N, but use and apply it if you have to as a foliar. <laughs> Okay, um, question here. Uh, it says, my mind is blown about nitrate poisoning in the context of plants. To clarify, is a manure application to a crop going to decrease nitrate levels in plants? Uh, manure has quite a lot of inorganic nitrogen in it, and it depends whether it's been composted or not. But if it's raw manure, it can be very detrimental to the soil and can be quite detrimental to plants because if you send raw manure off to the lab and have it analyzed, you'll find a lot of the nitrogen is in an inorganic form. It, it is as nitrates or nitrites or ammonium. So you probably, to answer that question, you need to take, get a sample of your manure, send it off to the lab and find out what it's got in it. People, people think that the nitrogen in manure is organic. Uh, in other words, it's in the amino form, but it's not. Some of it is, but usually more than half of it is not. I have a question here on Facebook from Brian says, are we causing more damage to microbes in the soil by using any amount of synthetic nitrogen? 
or is reducing your synthetic over time an, an appropriate path? Basically, should he go, go cold turkey or, you know, no. is it detrimental to the soil? Don't, don't go cold turkey. It is detrimental to the soil, but a small amount, as I said, like about five pounds per acre of N, for some strange reason, stimulates the natural nitrogen fixing process. No one really knows why. It primes it. It's a, it you have a priming effect from using a little bit of inorganic N. So it's not something that you need to eliminate completely. Some people feel they would just like to eliminate it completely and probably use um, an amino form like a fish hydrolysate or something instead. But um, you don't need to eliminate it completely. You just need to cut it back. It's just detrimental in really high, high doses. And also we tend to, you know, we tend to load it up front and <laughs> plants just can't possibly use it. A little tiny plant can't possibly use all the nitrogen that we, we put near a seed. So it's just going to go somewhere else, up into the air or up into the water somewhere. It's a huge waste of money, as much as, as well as all the other, <laughs> yeah, all the downsides to it. It's, it's just a huge waste of money. Uh, do you have any thoughts on neem oil? Does that harm the soil microbiome? I'm trying to get rid of grub worms in some plots. Yes, I, I don't know. Sorry, no, I have no idea. That that's one. fine. That's not one I've heard of either. Um, same line. So if you don't know the answer to this, that's uh, fine. Uh, feather meal. No, I don't know. I presume it's um, chopped up feathers. <laughs> 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 Other than that, I don't know. I'd okay. have to say, I, I, I would imagine that the nitrogen there would be in an organic form. In other words, I'd say it was pretty tightly held in feather meal, but I don't know how quickly it would be broken down in the soil or how readily available it would be. Don't know. Look it up on Google. <laughs> there you go. They're, they're trying to stump you. We've done what, this is our third one. So at this point, we're just looking for ways to stump you. <laughs> Uh, Claire wants to know about rust, blight, fungal infections in plants, um, and if there's anything that the plant has the ability to protect against these in the sociobiome. Yeah, that's a really good question because that's something I have seen time and time again. In Australia, our main grain crop is wheat, and it's subject to all kinds of uh, what we call rusts um, and also some various other, you know, fungal pathogens. And they're carried as spores just basically on the wind. So once there's rust in the in the atmosphere, it just will just blow across all the farmers' fields, we'll all get these spores, will land on the leaves of their plants. And you know, the plant breeding, the plant breeders try to breed rust resistant varieties, but the rust keeps on mutating and then a new strain of rust will come out and then everything, you know, falls victim to rust. But what we see is that where farmers are using plant diversity, using covers, have moved away from using high analysis fertilizers and they're using biostimulants or biological fertilizers or compost or something like that. In other words, they're moving to a biological system that even though those rust spores blow in the wind and come across all the fields get an equal amount theoretically of it, that you can see a fence line effect where on one side of the fence, the plants are perfectly clear, same variety, same at the same time, everything the same, there is no rust on the leaves of those plants. So obviously when we get that soil sociobiome functioning, we stop in fact using fungicides <laughs> um, and get that fungal energy channel open that there are a lot of beneficial microbes that are able to, uh, that have plant protection benefits. And in fact, some of the nitrogen fixing microbes have very strong uh, plant protection benefits as well. Not only do they fix nitrogen, some of the bacteria that not only fix nitrogen for the plant, but also help to protect the plant. Because I guess the plant is feeding the soil sociobiome. So the sociobiome is going to try and protect the plant if it possibly can. But yeah, there's a very strong correlation. In fact, the more fungicides we use, the more fungal infections we'll see in our crops the more, uh, you know, the more toxic chemicals we use, the more pests and diseases we have. We have to back off on those, only use them if absolutely necessary and just get that soil 
really um, absolutely thriving and get that fungal energy channel open and functioning and feeding all the groups of, you know, the other groups of microbes that live in the soil. And a lot of those have very strong plant protection qualities. And the plant will also take up microbes from the soil if it needs to as endophytes, beneficial endophytes. And that's something I am going to be talking about next week. So that's actually probably a good uh, segue into what I'm going to be talking about next week is if we have in a horticultural situation, we have some perennial plants, you know, our fruit trees or our grapevines or whatever they might be. And in the interrow, we can have this multi-species um, cover crop that is going to create a diverse microbiome in the interrow that our perennial plants are able to tap into and they can actually take endophytes from that interrow um, and use them to, uh, to combat diseases in the perennial plants themselves. And that's something I will talk about next week. It definitely happens in diverse systems. So diversity is going to be the key there. Okay, this is a rather interesting question, something I have not thought about here, but uh, Didi says, great to see you, Christine. Researchers are saying that the reason plants are higher in carbohydrates and also lower in nutrients than they used to be is because of the increased levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. But it sounds like plants are trying to, pro or plants that are trying to process inorganic nitrogen in a not available form might be part of the issue. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, it was too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I just think, you know, if, if plants are taking up inorganic nitrogen, that's it's going to be an issue for just about everything that you can think of, including human nutrition, animal nutrition, um, yeah, global climate, everything. It's all, it's, there is nothing, I have nothing good to say about inorganic nitrogen and we do not want to have it in our soil, we don't want to have it in our plants. But I, I can't directly answer that question, sorry. Uh, have you heard or have any thoughts on adding humic acid to nitrogen fertilizer in the transition period to buffer those negative effects? I have heard of people doing that and I'm just not really sure about that one. That's another one I don't know. No, whether that's whether that's just a sales pitch or whether that actually works. You're better off just using a an, an organic nitrogen fertilizer. As I said, something like fish hydrolysate. You don't have to buffer anything then. And it's it will still be um, those amino acids will be taken, absorbed by plant leaves. You, you, you will still get the nitrogen effect. The plants will still benefit from the nitrogen in that. And why don't we just avoid inorganic nitrogen altogether or more or less altogether? Uh, Willie asked, do the free living nitrogen fixing bacteria increase in fixing capacity as the diversity increases? Do the free living fixers have the same fixing capacity as do the legume associated fixers? I'm trying to wrap my head around that one as well. That came from Willie Pretorius. <laughs> I know who that came from. When you said Willie, I thought, oh, he's always asking hard questions. What was the first question again? <laughs> Do the free living nitrogen fixing bacteria increase in their fixing capacity as diversity increases? Do they get more efficient as your diversity increases? Well, I mean, the answer to that question is that as plant diversity increases, microbial diversity increases, and microbes function better in diverse teams. You know, when there's some microbes that can do one thing and others that can do another and they work together, then the overall efficiency of the system improves. Teamwork in the microbial world is always going to be better than one microbe trying to do everything on its own. So even though the efficiency of one particular species of nitrogen fixing bacteria may not necessarily increase when you have a whole lot of different species. Also, they're going to be working with uh, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria and they're going to be working with bacteria that are able to activate uh, trace elements and minerals and all those sorts of things. The whole teamwork is what's going to be important and you're going to lift the energy level of the whole system to a higher level. And yes, it will fix more in. I mean, it's going to be able to 
when the stratiobiome is really functioning effectively, it's going to be able to fix all the nitrogen that a big crop like corn, for example, needs. So yes, it is going to be able to, um, you know, I, I can't really see why you would want to be relating that to what, what can legumes, you know, how much nitrogen can, right? Like, I mean, we know that the rhizobium associated with legumes, for example, are hugely affected by the environment that the legume is growing in and how much nitrogen fertiliser you use. If you put nitrogen fertiliser on a legume, the rhizobium bacteria in the nodules stop fixing nitrogen. And the same thing is going to happen to the soil sociobiome. If we add nitrogen fertiliser, then any free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in there that are capable of fixing nitrogen are going to stop doing it simply because the nitrogen is already available. So I'm still not quite sure about about that question. I'd have to say it's a tip, Willie won't mind me saying this, a typical South African question. <laughs> we had a little bit of the other day <laughs> about does it really matter? <laughs> Just get that soil building happening and get those riser sheets and get those aggregates forming because there are going to be so many physical, biological, chemical benefits to the whole ecosystem. And if you can see soil building happening, then everything else is going to happen to. I'm, I'm beginning to learn there's two, two kinds of people in this space, those that uh, really want to understand every detail of what's happening. And then there's people like me that are like, well, I'm, I think this works. I'm going to just go for it. <laughs> I'm with you now. <laughs> All you need is a spade. <laughs> That's, there you go. Uh, Claire is actually in Ireland, so she is wondering if you know where in Ireland that experiment on plant diversity uh, or how she can find out more on that. Okay, so the guy uh, that did the first experiment that I was referring to was Thomas Maloney, and he did the experiment while he was with Chugask, and he did it as his PhD. So if you Google Tom Maloney, and it was with uh, pastures that were grown for silage, but if you want the link, how about I send you that link, Noah? So uh, I think Keith might have already found the one to the Yenna Biodiversity Experiment, but I'll send you the link to that Irish research because it, it was really insightful. They used up, I'm pretty sure it was 320 kilos per hectare of N. And then as a follow on from that, there was the Smart Grass Project, which was looking at um, how much forage can you produce in a diverse pasture without using nitrogen just to try and help Irish um, livestock producers move away from using nitrogen because it was so detrimental to the, um, to the wider environment, particularly to the water. Um, and then that transformed into smart sward. So it started off as smart grass and then they realized, hey, it's not actually about grass, it's about all the other things. And it's now called the smart sward project. So if she Googles smart sward, you'll find out a lot of, uh, it's been um, undertaken by the, University College of Dublin in Dunedin and in com combination with Chagask and several other organisations. Smart Grass, Smart Sward and Thomas Maloney will find it. And I think Thomas Maloney is actually with a seed company now. He might be a competitor for green cover. <laughs> DLF Seeds or something like that, I think he's with. Okay. Uh, Randy says, how late is too late to tissue test? Gosh, you, you know, if your plants look perfectly healthy and they're a good green colour, you probably don't need to do a tissue test at all. I mean, you would only do it if you thought that there was some, there was an issue, I think. You know, it's going to cost you money to to go out and collect samples and send them off. Really, you, you, you know, from the, from the day the plants germinate, you need to be looking at their roots to see are they forming riser sheaths. They're not forming riser sheaths and the seedlings don't look all that good. Well, you'd want to be doing tissue tests, you know, probably when they're three or four weeks old. Josh has a, an observation that his cool season annuals tend to grow more slowly than his neighbor who does apply inorganic nitrogen. Is the release of nitrogen through the organic process uh, temperature dependent at all? And if so, uh, what temperature does it typically start to catch up with uh, nitrogen fertilizer? 
uh, his cool season annuals. What is he using them for? Is this for grain production or is he talking about a past? Can you just start? Can you read that question again, please now? Yeah, and Josh, if you are, if you're on, it'd be great if you could um, type in as well what the goal is on that crop that you're growing. Just says I've noticed my cool season annuals grow more slowly in cool weather than my neighbor's inorganic nitrogen supplemented cereals. So definitely a cereal, ah, but I'm not cereals. sure if it's okay. a, a wheat or rye. All right, now that's a really, really good, uh, and then he's just put grazing there. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, if, if it was for, for grain, and that was something I should have mentioned, if you're going to transition from a high input system to one that's going to be more supportive of the soil associated biome, in the early stages of growth, your crops are not going to look like your neighbour's crops across the fence because they've um, basically put them on steroids. They've just given them lots of water-soluble P, lots of water-soluble N, and they're gonna grow lots of leaves in a really short amount of time. But you're gonna have a dysfunctional root system and they're gonna probably fall over the first, you know, plant pathogen that comes through the first lot of, you know, some kind of fungal pathogen, they're gonna be susceptible to it. Or if there's an insect pest, they're gonna be susceptible to it. Your plants, if you've got, let's just call it a biological system, are going to invest a lot of energy into producing roots and rises sheets and supporting the soil microbiome. They're gonna be very resilient plants. They're gonna be very nutrient dense plants. When it gets to um, right through to the final stage of yield, you'll find that even though you're, if we're talking about a cereal now that's been grown for grain, but even though in the early stages, your neighbor's gonna be laughing at you, your neighbor is not gonna be laughing at you when you're harvesting that crop because you're gonna have nutrient dense grain. It's gonna be plumper, it's gonna be heavier. Um, you know, the falling numbers are going to be higher, all those things. I don't know what kind of tests you use in the United States, but the protein content is going to be higher. Everything about that grain is going to be more robust and it's going to be more nutrient dense and the plants are going to be more resilient if there's a drought or if there's water logging or any kind of stress or a late frost or something like that. So it's like the hare and the tortoise, basically. <laughs> At the end of the, of the race, your uh, grain is going to be superior to your neighbours and you're going to have more money in the bank than your neighbour. Now, if this is for grazing, it might well be that the cool season annuals might only be, let's say, half the height of the neighbours once, but they could have double the nutrient density. And you'll find that you're, um, if you're testing bricks, probably need to hop over the fence and measure bricks levels on your neighbours um, cool season annuals. You might find that if they're using high analysis fertilizers, that their brick levels might be two or three, something like that. Yours might be 15 or 16, which means that you have uh, far more um, protein and energy and vitamins and minerals and everything in your pasture, even though it's shorter, uh, the feed conversion efficiency is going to be much greater and your livestock will actually do better on less, if you like. Then it's, it's like you could have more and more of something that's got nothing in it. I mean, you just imagine like say a, a huge pile of lettuce, like if you were a person and you just, you come into the dining table, it's just covered in a huge pile of lettuce, it's got nothing in it. Or a small bowl of salad that's got lots of different herbs and um, nutrient dense foods, you know, like it, it's not the volume that's important, it's how much nutrient is actually in there. So if it's biologically grown and it's grown in soil that's supportive of the microbes that are able to access the nutrients that and the trace elements that the plant needs, it can be half the height, but still more productive in terms of livestock production. If you're looking at live weight gains, they are correlated almost directly with bricks. Uh, he needs to get a refractometer, measure the bricks levels of his crop and the bricks levels of the neighbours. Now, if your crop is only half the height of the neighbours and the bricks levels are the same, you have a problem. <laughs> because you have something that hasn't grown as well and it's also not functioning either. So that's maybe when you need to do some leaf tests and find, it, find out what it hasn't got in it and, and start thinking about why. But I think you'll find the bricks levels will be much higher in the shorter plants, which means that the energy and the protein and the minerals and trace elements will be great for your livestock if it's for grazing. And also if they're cereals, um, why has he not got four functional groups in there? 
So I'm glad you brought up four functional groups. Uh, and we did touch on this last week and the week before that, but there tends to be a lot of questions around this um, topic of four groups. A lot of people are asking, um, well, Matthew first asked, are legumes in your plant community bad? Which I'm assuming the answer is no, but I'll let you address that. And what are some examples of the companions, especially in pastures, kind of the, a lot of the questions I'm getting for those four functional groups. Do you have any examples of plants that they can be putting in there? Okay, so if we just go back to the Irish research, uh, the four functional, well, the four plant families that they've used for pastures, so this is for livestock production, have been grasses and legumes, the legumes in that case of clovers, and also um, alfalfa and um, bird's foot trefoil, sandfoin, um, all those kinds of things that they're, they're all legumes, even though they're different species, they're still in the one functional group. And then they've got chicory in there, which is in Asteraceae, which is in the daisy family, and plantain, which is in Plantagenaceae. Um, yeah, well, it's in the plantain family. <laughs> uh, so they're four different plant families that have been throughout all of the Irish research. I don't know whether it was good luck or good management. Um, I love the Irish, so I'll say probably both. <laughs> uh, that they, they've got four functional groups in there and it has just worked extremely well. My question is, is maybe is that all you need? Um, so the, the photograph I showed before of a, in a cover crop situation of where there was radish, uh, which is in Brassicaceae, oats, which is in Poaceae, sunflowers in Asteraceae in the daisy family and then Phacelia, which is in Baraginaceae. We had four functional groups there and that looked incredibly healthy. So my question is, did we, did we actually need to go more than that? Did we need to have any more than four species provided that they were from four functional groups? I mean, it might even come back to as long as you've got four functional groups, you've got enough. But certainly in the Irish situation, um, they do only have four functional groups and they've found that they've been able to cut nitrogen out of the system completely and still maintain yield and that's for grazing. And there are some Irish dairy farmers that have gone, like they've gone up to 20 species. So they start putting in a whole lot of herbs like uh, sheep's parsley, for example, which is in um, parsley, it's in Apiaceae the carrot family, um, they use burnet, which is also quite commonly used in the United States, I believe, and that's in the uh, rosaceae family. So it's, believe it or not, the same family as apples and roses and those kinds of things. So that's a very different functional group. I think one of the reasons burnet is so popular and so widely used in pastures, it's got condensed tannins in it, it's anthelmintic, it uh, stimulates feed conversion efficiency, it's an incredible plant for including in pastures. So I would definitely be putting chicory and plantain in there and burn it uh, in addition to, uh, you know, whatever grasses and legumes. Yes, yeah, small burn it. I see Keith put a comment there. Um, good, You're, you put it in your mixes, that's great. That, that would be the one, if, if the Irish were going to put something else in there, I would put burn it in there. So this is not necessarily in regards to nitrogen, but you made a comment there about maybe those four to eight species is all we need. How does that differ then? I, I heard your talk and I believe we have that on our YouTube page about the, the quorum sensing. And you've talked there about, you know, the number 12 being kind of an important species. And maybe we're going back to, we don't need to understand it, just <laughs> plan it, move on. But uh, seem to be kind of two different things that we're saying there. Do you want to comment on the quorum yeah. sensing aspect? That, that's really good um, point, Noah, because originally when people started experimenting with different numbers of species, you know, like Gabe Brown would have been one of the leaders in that, you know, putting in different, and Jay Fuhrer, you know, putting in different numbers of plants together. And they did that experiment in the Burley um, Soil Conservation District when, when was that, back in 2006 or something, where they had that six-way mix that was so incredibly drought tolerant compared to all of their monocultures. And that was when people really started looking at, um, okay, so do you need six species? Do you need eight species? And then farmers in New Zealand started using 12 species. And they were using 12 plant species and getting incredible results from it. And we're thinking, okay, so maybe you do need to have 12. But then when you looked at the 12 that they were using, 
probably four of those were grasses. Four might have been legumes. So there's eight out of the 12. And then the other four would have been things like chicory and plantain and maybe burnet and sheep's parsley. Um, so that in actual fact, even though they had 12 species, they may have only had four functional groups. There's been some really, really good results, uh, results coming out of England where uh, people have had six plant families or sometimes even eight plant families in a, in a cover. And, you know, getting rapid soil building and phenomenal crops, the follow on crop has been phenomenal. So I'm thinking that in the early days, we thought it was all about species. But then if you say a 12 way mix is gonna be beneficial for your soil, I then noticed that some farmers would go out and get six grasses, I'm talking again about pastures, six grasses and six legumes, because it's really easy to get six legumes. There's all these different clovers that you can get and um, you know, throw in alfalfa and sandpoint and, and whatever. And before you know it, it's easy to get six legumes, it's very easy to get six different grasses. And I think I've got a 12 way mix, but they've actually only got two functional groups. So it could well be that someone else who just has four functional groups and four species, like a grass, a legume, and chicory and plantain, for example, may do just as well. And it looks like the results that are coming out of the Smart Grass Project and the Smart Sward Project in Ireland tend to back that up because they only do have four functional groups in there. I'm sure there's advantages to having more species. So some of the dairy farmers, for example, who are putting in 20 way mixes and they've got all these pasture herbs in there. Um, it's going to have to be beneficial, you would think, for, animal, for, for animals to have that wide diversity you know, of plants because every plant is going to have you know, different vitamins and minerals in it. Like there's going to have to be some kind of incremental benefit from having more species in there. But I think the main benefit is going to come from four functional groups. And that's something that we've only come to realise, or perhaps I've only come to realise, I don't know, in the last two years, 12 months to two years. So some of my old videos, I mean, this is the problem with, you know, the internet these days, you can go back to a video that was made in 2010 or something like that. Like, you know, that's 11 years old now. And there's probably nothing really fundamentally wrong with any of the information, but we have moved on, you'd hope. You know, like even next week, hopefully we'll know more than we know this week and the week after we'll know more. So the more we're seeing and the more diversity experiments that are being conducted around the world and the more farmers are experimenting with these things, the more we're seeing is, okay, what, how can we distill the, inf, you know, the absolutely essential information out of this? And the essential information seems to be it's, it's not so much about the number of species you have, but the number of diverse functional trays you have. In other words, you know, what's a functional tray? Like it's like, uh, and we want, in the literature, they talk about asynchronous functional trays. In other words, plants that don't grow at the same time and have the same kind of root structure or um, photosynthetic pathway. Like in the early days, you may remember, uh, I'll go back to Gabe Brown again, talking about, you know, Warm season broadleafs, warm season grasses, cool season broadleafs, cool season grasses. Like that's what we thought was important. But in actual fact, you could have 12 species that fit within those categories and still only have two functional groups because you may just have grasses and legumes. The chances are though, you're going to have some brassicas in there because your cool season broadleafs are probably going to be brassicas. So you may have three functional groups but just think how much further could you go by just throwing in another one? And that's why I think when we talk about things like flax um, or linseed, which is the same thing, which is in Linaceae, a very, very different plant family to all of the others, or something like, um, well, Facelia in Baraginaceae, um, a very, very different plant family to, to our grasses and our legumes. And we talk about the benefits we see putting something like flax into a companion crop mix. Is it because the flax, flax is amazing. There is no doubt about it. It has an incredible root system. But is it just the fact that flax is an amazing plant and it's non-competitive and it's a great companion? Or is it that flax is so different to everything else? It's in a completely different family. It's not like any other family that we're using. 
and it gives us that functional diversity. It's probably a mycster of both things. Lax is great, it's mycorrhizal, has an incredible root system, but it's also providing a lot of functional diversity. And that may be where the key to including things like Lax and um, Cecilia. You know, are, are they exceptional plants in their own right or is it that they are so different to everything else? So in our companions, I would definitely be looking at just putting some really different things in there, in, in our companion crops. Because, you know, you can put things in there that won't be competitive with the cash crop. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to the stage where we can find companions for all of our cash crops. That I know there's lots of other things that we've been thinking about, you know, like interseeding and all of that, um, that we'll be able to just grow companions in with cash crops with no problems whatsoever. They won't be competitive. They will actually be cooperative and, and we'll we'll get higher yields. Um, it, it's this functional diversity is something, it's going to be very important, I, I believe. We just probably don't know enough about it at the moment. So, so if, if I ever wanted to correct anything that I've said in the past, <laughs> I would now correct that you probably don't need, you, you especially don't need 12 species if they're six of them are grasses and six of them are legumes. It's not gonna get you very far. You've only got two functional groups. Okay, we are, we're past seven, but I wanna get to this last question here because I think it's important. Um, and that is, what are some good soil biology or soil ecology books that you recommend for anyone who's wanting to learn more? The top of my head, I can't think of one. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll think of one for you. It's called our Soil Health Resource Guide where Christine has written articles. Uh, we have lots of good information. You can request one for free on our website. <laughs> You're right, Noah. I agree. Sorry, I, I was sort of thinking of a book, you know, by Chelsea Green or something or other like that. But yes, the Soil Health Resource Guide, I'll give it, you know, 20 out of 10. There, there you go. go. <laughs> it, it's not technically a soil ecology book, but we got it. We got Christine's approval. So that that's all we need. Uh, thank you so much. That was excellent as always. Um, and the presentation went smoothly. I thought it was great. So we've got one last session here that we're going to do next week. I do not remember what the title is off the top of my head. I know what the topic, but you want to tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Yeah, it's uh, something about cover crops and something about horticulture. <laughs> no, <There we> go. <laughs> but, but the the emphasis next, it was about carbon. I think it was uh, cover crops for carbon storage in horticultural soils or something like that. Um, and I will definitely be talking about carbon sequestration. But the more I look into this, into diversity and endophytes and all that sort of thing, and the huge plant protection benefits that we can get from having a diverse cover crop in the interrow in a horticultural situation. So one of the main things I'm going to talk about next week is how plants can actually access those microbes that are in the soil. So we've got soil living microbes that are internalized by plants and become endophytes. I think that's extraordinary that something that's living in the soil is taken into the plant and becomes, and is going to be, um, you know, nurtured by the plant because it's going to give the plant um, protection against pests and diseases. But the plant can't get those microbes to help it to protect itself if we have bare interrows. So, so we need you know, covered interrows for carbon storage and we need diversity in that ground cover in the interrow to, because we know microbial or plant diversity is gonna increase, microbial diversity is going to increase carbon storage. And that's, that's what originally like a month ago or so I said I was going to talk about and I still am. But also I'm gonna to add to that, like how those um, perennial plants are going to be able to access the microbes that are growing underneath our annual cover crop that's in the interrow and actually internalize those microbes and use them for, for plant protection. Well, there you go. Um, the good news is if you guys are on this webinar, I will automatically sign you up. But if there is somebody that you think would um, benefit from this next week's webinar, uh, you can email me at Noah, that's N-O-A-H at greencoverseed.com. And I can send you uh, a link that you can send to your family, friends, anybody that uh, would be interested, and I can get you the link to register for that. 
This webinar is recorded, so we'll have that uploaded on Thursday morning for you to share as well. Um, I think that about wraps us up for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Christine, for your time. We really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your week. <laughs> thank you very much, Noah. And again, uh, it was a huge pleasure to be part of your webinar series today. And um, I said I was gonna send you two links. One was to the Yano experiment. I think Keith found that one. Can you remember what the second one was? Was it was something to do with the Irish research? Oh, I think yes. it was that, uh, Tom Maloney's research. Yeah, it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic research. So I'll do that now and you'll be able to add that to the, to the page. Yep, Perfect. okay, thank you very much, Noah. Great to work with you as always. I'll be happy to know I ordered that book you recommended, so. We'll use it, Dale. Read it and I don't, will. don't I just will. Enjoy it. Good. <laughs> I want to hear of a dramatic improvement by next week. Okay. No. If I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger's younger days. Then no, 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 no. We just want you to have a mobile back. We want your back. That, that would be a great start. Yes. 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 And you can be eternally grateful to me. Right. Yeah, yeah. Am to the knowledge of <laughs> okay, Dale. Now, now you at least have to tell people what the book is. Otherwise, I will get emails saying, "I heard at the end of the webinar there was a book." I'll I'll trim this I'll trim this part out anyway. But you might as well tell people what the book Read is. Read your own back. It's a book by Robin, Robin McKenzie. R O B I N. Robin is a male. Robin McKenzie. Treat your own back. If anyone has any problems with bulging discs, it is absolutely fantastic. I got Mr. it for six dollars and thirty nine cents on World of Books. <gasps> well, read it and use it. <laughs> I will do so. Uh, well, I, I can't think of a better way to end the webinar. I'm just going to end it with fix your own back <laughs> and have a great rest of your week. <laughs> uh, see, see you, you now. Bye. Take care, see guys. Now. Okay, bye. <laughs>